much for, for coming. Oh, I guess it's good afternoon. It is six minutes now into the afternoon. So good afternoon. Thank you for being here. And um, today we're going to be having our next lecture in the Native Voices Lecture Series, which is co-sponsored by the National Library of Medicine, the Spencer S. Eccles Health Sciences Library, the University of Utah Office of um, Health Equity and Inclusion and the American Indian Resource Center. And we're so thankful for, for all of our co-sponsors here today. We also, for the first time in the lecture series, um, we're now able to announce that um, CME, or so Continuing Medical Education Credit, is available for, uh, for this lecture and for the whole series. We've been um, digitally videotaping these um, programs. And so on the table for those who may be looking for uh, CME credit, there are two, two items. One, um, the way to sign up and, and get logged in for your credit. And then there's a survey for you to fill out and leave with us if you could, or um, scan it and email it back to us. That would be great. And um, I also wanted to remind you that there, um, there are still more events that are happening in the lecture series. They are described in this brochure, which is on the table. And tomorrow evening, there is a medical ethics discussion related to Native Voices called Continuing the Native Voices Conversation in Utah. How can professionals trained in Western medicine work with Native communities to improve their health status? So. Um, please consider looking at this brochure and consider joining us at um, the additional lectures and presentations before the exhibit leaves, um, which it leaves on Sun, well, actually on Monday, but the last day to see the exhibit is Sunday, November 8th. But today we are very pleased to have Beverly Patchell, um, who is assistant professor of psychology and mental health in the College of Nursing. And she's going to be presenting to us on the medicine wheel and mental health. Uh, Dr. Beverly Patchell is a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and also Muskogee Creek. Research interests include interpersonal and domestic violence, substance abuse, cancer, and diabetes with a focus on mental health issues. Current and her current active research is in domestic violence prevention. Um, and going to pass the microphone over to Be Beverly and she will begin. Yeah, then you don't have to worry about it. Oops. I'm not going to give you my badge unless you want to be Joan for a while. But Beverly knows so much more about this than I do. So. <laughs> All right. All Thank right. you. All right. Thank you. Just one small correction. It's psychiatric mental health, oh, not I'm psychology. <laughs> That's okay. I just thought, oh, she doesn't recognize my abbreviation. <laughs> that was my fault. Osio <laughs> Toheju. Welcome. Hello. How are you? I'm happy to be here to talk to you about the medicine wheel and mental health. Uh, my purpose is not to educate you necessarily about the the, the delicacies and the finer uh, issues of the medicine wheel, I'm not going to portray one as any particular, for any particular tribe. So I want to make sure that's clear. Um, I'm, what I'm using it as is more symbolic, more, more symbology of, um, how, of how the world is conceptualized by Native people, how mental health is conceptualized, how mental illness is conceptualized, so that we, you can maybe gain a better understanding of how, what these terms mean and how these concepts apply to the lives of Native people, not only historically, but right now, contemporarily as well. So we'll move on. So what is mental health? I'm hoping that this will be a more of a dialogue than a presentation. Because what I've found in, work, in all the years I've worked in mental health is that people have their own 
history with it. They have their own ideas about what it means, what it means to them personally, to their family, to the community, to society. And so what I found is that these, this mental health is actually a construct that's defined by parameters. And some of those parameters are cultural, and we'll talk about those cultural parameters related to Native people, but we'll also have to look at the cultural parameters of other cultures, because those certainly impinge and impact the Native culture and their their definitions and their ability to maneuver uh, their culture through other cultural constructs that maybe are hindering or uh, defining for them what mental health is. So what kinds of, thinking of your own culture, what kind of uh, background do you think, what, what, give me a, a, a definition that you might have from your own culture of what mental health is. What does it mean to be mentally healthy in your culture? And you can define that in terms of your family culture, your religious culture, your societal culture, your ethnic culture, because we have all those things that are part of us and they all help define those, all, fine tune all of those things. Because what one person may see as crazy, the other person sees as okay and normal and part of what they do in their everyday life. So somebody want to, want to uh, speak up? Yes. Well, in the Philippine culture, mental health is associated with the uh, ability to cope um, well, to be mm -hmm. resilient, and not to be So crazy. coping, resilient in the, in, the, in the Philippine culture, and not to be crazy. Uh -huh. So not crazy is mental health. Yeah, so mental health is actually um, associated with the ability to deal with Ability to deal with things? Mm -hmm. Everyday stresses. Okay, that's that sounds good. Anybody else? Somebody else have some? Yes. I'll help you out, Emily. Go ahead. So my family is multi generational Western United States. And okay. It's just funny you should say that. Um, the family motto is we do hard things. So the idea is mental health, mentally healthy people can do hard things and kind of forge ahead, pull up your socks. You know, so the old pull up, pull yourself up by the bootstraps yeah, exactly. stuff. And, mm -hmm. and not a lot of complaining when they're fussing, but, but achieving and accomplishing hard things in a resilient way. Mm -hmm. So for your culture, achieving uh, hard things in a resilient way. Uh -huh. Okay, so we could take, take a step back and talk about resilience and where that comes from and how do you get it, how do you lose it, how do you gain it, how do you keep it those kinds of things, because those are all uh, part of mental health as well, having that resiliency to cope. And uh, resilience is, is one of the themes that runs through the class I teach when we're talking about mental health with, the, with elderly people, what's their resilience. So I think it holds true for all of us though, in terms of resilience and in terms of defining ourselves as healthy or not healthy. Somebody else? How about your culture, friends? Yeah, I'm gonna pick on you, because I know you'll answer me. <laughs> <laughs> Health, healthy mental status is being a good community member mm -hmm. because it's not for us it has no the nexus is not individualism it's how do you support and fit into the community in a productive way. Mm -hmm. So it's a communal rather than an individual issue. Right. And if you, if you think about it, before colonization, before um, the um, influx of Western culture, there were no um, institutions for mental illness in this country. There were no um, people who were designated as outliers. People were not cast out of the tribe or the clan system because maybe they didn't quite think correctly. So all of that process was, was brought in and put in there. So that's kind of a social and political piece as well. So what are we looking at today in terms of mental health from a social perspective? If you don't want to talk about culture, what about the social perspective? What are we seeing in the paper every day when, when you see when you open it up and look is there always something about mental health or mental illness? We'll talk about illness in a minute. Let's just talk about health. What kinds of things do you see in, in the media that tells you what you need to do to be mentally healthy? Take a pill. Take a pill. Well, that's one. That's one. That's a really strong message. Or eat a certain food. 
maybe. Mm -hmm. Do yoga. Yeah, that's a little more along the other end of the, co the continuum of what you might see in terms of what's healthy. Uh, you know, you see a lot of things defined as natural, as um, um, holistic, as organic. So, so all of these things tend to make you think healthy, right? Not only for your physical health, but your mental health as well. Because we can show you really clearly how if you get deficient in certain enzymes or minerals, you're going to look and present very mentally ill if, if, that thing, if you get out of balance with those things because that's just the way the body is. It has to be in that state of balance. So mental health is a comparative thing, right? So we make judgments about that. That's crazy, that's not. This is healthy, this isn't. And so we're trying to maneuver ourselves through our cultures, through society, through the world in terms of making those decisions about ourselves and what's, what's good for us. And that's no different in any culture. All cultures are trying to do that. So think about in this country how we have converged all of these cultures. We all have the same goal. We want to succeed. We want to be healthy. We want to be happy. We want to uh, provide for ourselves and our family. We're, you know, Nobody comes here and says, oh, I want to, take, I want to be on welfare. No, nobody comes here for that. They come here to succeed. They come here to be successful. And it doesn't always happen. And so how we define what's healthy and what isn't is, is very much uh, a part of all those different things. And so I just want to make that point because I think we have to have, to have a dialogue, to have an understanding about Native people and their ideas about mental health, mental illness, and, and how that fits with the culture, you also have to be aware of your own culture. And all of the things that impinge on Native culture impinges on everybody else's culture as well. So let's look at mental illness real quickly. Um, it's also defined by culture. Uh, sometimes the culture uh, has borrowed ideas and um, behaviors and beliefs from other cultures though because we always you know as we as we come together those things get shared those things cross over ethnicities and and they become kind of part of our definition as well but for native people like I said there was never um, a, a time when people were not allowed a place to fit in so that if somebody and, and I, I know this is true for Aboriginal tribes in Australia because I've talked to them about it in, in also New Zealand and and I think it's probably across the board, just because there wasn't this idea that people needed to be compartmentalized and put somewhere if they didn't conform to what the bigger group was doing. They found a way to weave what that person's strengths were into, um, into the culture. And so if the person just wanted to play and dance and sing, then they were in charge of playing and dancing and singing. And so they brought that into, into the group, into the community, and that was their strength and they were, that was used like that. Um, and there's also a more contemporary version um, of that is that someone who, if you, someone who's kind of manic, who might talk a lot and, and is always involved in things and, you know, you can't keep them quiet. So they might just be paired with someone who's, who's very quiet and needs someone to talk. And, and so they don't have to, and they can just listen and move along. And so they find these compatibilities within the within the group in the community so that it serves a purpose. Those things that were defined as illness, that might be defined as illness in another culture, could definitely be a help in, in, uh, in, a, in a native culture if they were able to do those kinds of pairing. And I've, I've seen that happen. And I've heard of it happening with, in certain groups. <coughs> so mental illness, how do we define that socially now? Let's go back to our social structure. So if we look at the American culture, uh, how is it defined? What, how does society look at mental illness? Weak. Someone is who's weak. What else? It is perceived with a, a, such a stigma. Stigma about it? Yeah, that it's not, it shouldn't exist, that it shouldn't be there, that it's a personal, like you said, a weakness maybe, that it's on the person, not the community? Mm -hmm. You think that, that fits? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see some nods. What about the political aspects of mental illness? What's going on there? There's a hand in the back. Well, politically, as the fee structure changes in the healthcare system, they're going, they're starting to talk about merging behavioral and physical health. They're all of a sudden starting to go, there's no place for mental health. So we're going to have to deal with them because they're going to cost us more. So it really all comes around what's going to cost. So, poli so politically, they're looking at cost. Right, That's 
that's your point is that it's looked at as a uh, debit maybe something that's going to cost us and so so if we redefine it you know they did that years ago with substance abuse when they when the studies came out that said no matter what you do they're not going to get better they're like oh well we're not going to pay for it any and then anyway so they quit they quit paying for treatment before that i you know we people could come in and get treatment for 30 days or 60 days or however long it took to really get them stable and move back out but now it's evaluate send somewhere else out because it doesn't matter what you do it's not going to work because so sometimes our studies trip us up <laughs> and and we have to uh, we wind up having to pay that political price because if it's not seen as uh, effective and efficient and I think we're in healthcare we're all dealing with that now because not just mental health and mental illness are looked at like that but every kind of illness whether you're having a heart heart surgery or whether you're having orthopedic procedure there's there's certain milestones you have to meet and you meet them in a certain order and in a certain time frame or somebody has to pay either the patient pays the provider pays the hospital pays or the rehab place pays whatever so there's always something that looks like somebody has to pay so when you when you have that kind of setup it's very comparative and very judgmental isn't it because that's what they're doing they're saying okay well on average people recover from this in three days so if you don't meet that average then hey it's going to cost you a little more for not meeting that middle ground uh, so it's that way with mental illness as well uh, as, as it is with physical and like you say they're trying to merge those and i'm not sure exactly how successful that's going to be although I know there are a lot of physical things that can happen that can certainly affect mental status and change how people behave and what they do um, so I these the medicine wheels that you're seeing are just a variety that I found here and there and they and I just I'm showing you these because they've been used in a lot of different ways to symbolize uh, people's projects to talk about their approaches and so I wanted you to just see how how um, how, how it's being used in terms of helping people understand. I like it because it's in a circle, because that's how I, um, how I think. And so it, traditionally, the medicine wheel was a guide for people in the community to know where they were in terms of their interactions within themselves, within their family, and within their community. How those things were all, could be productive, how they could, uh, how the behaviors that they were doing would, uh, would be uh, useful not only to themselves, their family, and their community, but they, so they had a place where they could contribute. They had a place where if they needed help, they had uh, resources to ask for that help, to, to pick that up. Um, so in a traditional way, uh, the medicine wheel was looked at as each direction being, uh, a, it was assigned a color. And like I said, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to teach about those kinds of things today. I'm just looking at it from the conceptual point of how it worked in, in society and how it worked in the community and it, with the individual as well. So if you're looking, if someone were to, were to um, be offering prayers, and traditionally they might start with a certain direction and go in a certain way, go uh, east, south, west, north, although there were some tribes that might go the other way. Um, so it depended on the tribe. The, the east is traditionally where things open. So that was uh, most, I don't know of any that don't start in the east. Although Francie might know one that <laughs> I've never heard of, an, one that did not start in the East when you start working with the medicine wheel. And so that would be the beginnings, that would be the newness, that would be sometimes it becomes um, the, uh, the resurrection point. So it can be conceptualized in a lot of different ways. And so it made it very useful because of that, because it used the directions. And while this two dimensional um, uh, p uh, picture of the medicine wheel, uh, shows all those different areas and those different pieces and what you kind of work on as you work your way around the life wheel if you use it as a life wheel from birth and childhood to adolescence to maturity to to uh, old age and wisdom in the north if you use it like that then it, it gives you a life plan so it was a way to structure thinking about living thinking about life thinking about going through all the processes as you do as you grow uh, you are born and grow up and grow old and, and pass on 
so traditionally it was used as a guide like that. Uh, and then it could also be used for any kind of particular issue that someone was looking at, if they wanted to look at it from all aspects. One thing this, this two-dimensional image doesn't reveal, though, is that there are other directions at play as well. There is the within, and then there was the, the without. So it looked at all of those, those aspects. If you're using it fully, you'll look at, at how, that re, how you reflect on that within, and that brings you to look at your spirit, the spirit that you have within you, the fire that you have, the flame that, that gives you inspiration, that gives you um, passion for life, for living, for the things that you need to do, for your plan. And then the without is not so much out in society, but out in terms of being connected to the greater source. Um, more contemporarily, it's used, the medicine wheel is used to, like I said, to track on things, to help people understand a process, to help people work through a process of growth, of change, of, of um, improving themselves if that's what they want to do, of watch, of tracking on, on how they, how, how things are affecting them and how they're uh, being um, able to, to impact that or not. And symbolically, it just means the wheel of life. You know, the medicine wheel is, has, um, has been around for a long time. In fact, there's the one in Wyoming that they don't know who built it. There's no particular tribal identity to it that they are, are for sure about. And they, and they don't know um, anything other than they preserve it. They hold it as special and it is protected. It is in a protected place and people come to visit it and, and give offerings. And so the symbology of the medicine wheel is just that of life. And I think that's why a lot of people have, um, have looked at it as, as a, something that they can use to symbolize um, moving through a process, symbolize um, a, a period of growth, symbolize a period of change, those kinds of things. So what were the barriers to living by the medicine wheel? Well, some of the barriers that are easily identified that we'll touch on today are colonization. So what does that mean? Well, that means when the country was settled, um, starting back in the 1600s, uh, and things were taken over, area was taken over. You know, there was not a concept of ownership of the land. We were part of the land, the land was us, we were it. You know, and it, it related to the Bible, ashes to ashes, you know, there was no, a lot of tribes had no problems with the religions that were brought the, with the Bible because a lot of it could be translated into that. I know the Cherokees did ha had no problem. They could see how that tracked with everything. You know, the eagles mentioned like 37 and 39 times in the Bible. Uh, they talk about natural things. They talk about natural remedies. They talk about like things like essential oils and herbs and plants and trees and how we communicate with all those things. So if you read the Bible from that perspective, it's all in there. Um, but it, that's not how it was translated into to, uh, how that was uh, affecting the culture. So we also have historical trauma as a barrier. How many of you know what historical trauma is? It's becoming kind of more known now. For a long time, it was poo-pooed as that's, that can't be real. But now science is saying, oh yeah, everything that's, your history affects your DNA, you pass that on to your kids, they pass it on to theirs, and now they've able to tra track that through the genetics which is something that we've said for a long, long time. So, so somebody had their hand up about historical trauma. What, what's yeah, your thoughts? Like generational poverty? Or, I mean, okay, so the question is, is that different than generational poverty? Uh, a little bit in that it is an ongoing, it, it is something that has happened. But see, with generational uh, poverty, that's perpetuated because the generations continue to be poor. Now, with historical trauma, it's about being um, traumatized in, uh, ancestors being traumatized and that trauma being passed on. And sometimes people don't even know, uh, they don't have the, the lived experience of it, but they have the, the um, connectedness to, the, to their genetic line that would, would carry that on. And so they might have some of the same reactions um, that, without even knowing why, why those things trigger it. Um, one of the, uh, you know, one of the things that I can relate to on a personal note with that is that 
you know, I grew up in northeastern Oklahoma, and there is a Cherokee Museum there, and it, it's a very nice museum, and I went to it. I lived not, I mean, I lived within walking distance of it for a long time as I was growing up, but I was, I, I had never been in it. Um, the, I'd been to the lobby, I'd been all around the building, but there was, um, I could see through, if you go into the lobby, you can see back into it, and there is a room there where they have a depiction of the Trail of Tears. And in that room, there are these white statues, life-size statues, in a trail, and they're, they're white, <coughs> and they're all huddled over as if they're walking through the snow, which is exactly what happened at the Trail of Tears when the Cherokees were moved. They, they moved them starting in November. So they had to go through the winter, and a lot of people died. And so they had this whole room about this size set up, and it was just full of these statues, and they were all uh, as, as if they were on the trail. And so I could see that. With it, you can see just kind of a, a piece of it without actually going in. So I could never go in to that, into the museum because I just couldn't stand the thought of going into that room. So I never, I never my whole life went there. And about 10 years ago, I had a friend <coughs> who visited from New Mexico, and so we, I took him around uh, where I grew up, and, and we went to the museum, and he says, oh, I'm going to go in. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> and I said, I'll be in the lobby. <laughs> and he's like, you're not coming in? No. <laughs> so so he, um, he was working on a process to, uh, to help uh, athletes perform better. So he said, um, and, and he had told me about it, but he said, well, wait here, let me, let me tell you, let me show you how, how this can work in a way that you've never even thought of. So he, so he showed it to me, and it's, it's a computer program, so I looked at it, and he says, it won't take long. I said, okay, I looked at it, and he says, okay, now let's see if you can go in. And so I, I said, oh, okay. I said, if you're buying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not spending my money for something I'm not going to go see. So he's, he said, okay, I'll buy, I'll, I'll pay it. And so we went in, and um, I, w I went all around that room. I never went in it. And then by the time we, we finished looking at all the other exhibits and things, I was able to walk through the room. And so I know that, uh, that historical trauma can be addressed in certain ways, and it, this way it was addressed through light and motion and, sa and, and movement. And... Um, so I was able to, um, uh, to, to go through the room that I had never been able to go through my whole life because of the, the impact that had on me, because my family went through that. My, you know, my ancestors went on that trail of tears, and, and um, it was just difficult to do that. And then I was able to overcome that through something totally unexpected, totally out of the blue. But it was, as I looked at that, because then I, I said, okay, now I want to see why that worked, because that doesn't make any sense that it should work <laughs> for what this is doing. He says, well, it, you don't know, he says, trauma can stop you from doing many things. Trauma can, bear, can create a barrier for you that uh, you, ca you can't conceptualize how to overcome. And so sometimes it's better that it comes as a surprise, because um, then it will... Um, you'll be able to just experience it and, and it'll be more meaningful to you. So it, since that time, what I've come to see how this, how it works is it's similar to rapid eye movement or EFT or those kinds of things that in that it triggers, it reaches a part of your brain that you don't have conscious access to, but it still allows it to, to, uh, to be improved and to be better. So the ongoing trauma that I'm talking about, that I've listed here is ongoing trauma about microaggressions, it's about the things that we deal with every day on a daily basis, it's Columbus Day, it's the, it's sometimes it's the sports mascots, I mean there's still a controversy on this own campus and on every other campus that uses those kinds of things, even the native campuses that use them, there's controversy about using them, so it's, it's across the board. Um, however, they have a little bit more legitimate claim to using those than some of the others. Uh, but the, so ongoing trauma can just be those microaggressions, those things that, that are imposed on you by what you see in the paper, by uh, people's comments, um, the, the use of the terminology, um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the names of places that were created that are still offensive to people and that it's like, well, we've been using it forever, so we're not going to change it. It's, it's just how we're known by. It's like, you'll just have to get over it. 
So part of the problem with getting over things is if it's ongoing, it's difficult for that without some kind of at least acknowledgement that it is a, a trauma and that um, it sh addressing it um, would be helpful to people who are traumatized by that. So legacy of intentions. So what do I mean by that? Well, there is a huge legacy of, of, uh, of governments, of people, of leaders trying to, um, to be part of, uh, of a solution. And you know, one of the worst solutions that was ever invented was the kill the Indian, save the man solution. That, w that they said, well, if, the, if we can't annihilate them, um, then we're going to change them into to us. And so that legacy of intentions is kind of, we're still, be, still being played out. Um, because it, it totally discounts the culture. Everything, the, you know, the, the things that were culturally important and sacred were outlawed. And so, and how we see it played out today, when I worked for the Cherokee Nation, I worked in home health. And one of the things you have to, because it's a Medicaid type situation, you have to follow their rules. Well, one of the rules is you can't accept anything from the people that you visit. So when culturally though, that's really difficult because when I go to someone's home and they offer me even water and I have to say, I can't take that, it's like an insult. And so I know that you've all dealt with this in other cultures. It's not just the native culture that's like that. There's lots of cultures who are community-based, who are family-based, that, that invite you in and want to offer you something and you should be able to take it. Well, that is totally against the rules in, in most medicine, uh, most uh, social services. You can't, you can't do those kinds of things. And so it was a very fine line you have to walk to not insult your, your, your client or your patient and yet still not break the law, not, not run your risk of your organization being sanctioned or you know, you're being in trouble. So those kinds of things create a, um, create a sense of um, tension. They create uh, a vigilance and that's all part of, of that you know that having that all the time wears on your immune system it impacts your health it impacts how your outlook on life how you think it directly impacts your joy so you're sharing your ability to share with your culture and these were you know the 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 patients that i was taking care of when i worked for the cherokee nation were cherokee patients so, so it's like we had this imposition that we could not function in our own culture with our own cultural patients in a way that was culturally congruent just because of the, uh, the, the laws about being paid, about the, the organization being able to um, uh, collect money for the, for the services that they were providing. So that's just a simple example, but it's, multiply that a hundred, a thousand times in just everyday life about how interactions occur and how, how people think and um, and, and what they want to do. So the, the intention was good. It was like, we can't let people take advantage of people who are vulnerable. And I, I clearly understand that intention, but it was a very much a barrier. Sometimes though, circumstances just require that you um, have to overlook that because there was a point when I was working there that the doctors in the Indian Health Service Hospital, there was a huge uh, Cherokee Alzheimer's study that went on back in the 90s. Uh, looking at does degree of native blood protect you from Alzheimer's and actually they'd found that it did the higher the quantum the less likely they were to get Alzheimer's but in the in terms of those early days they were given put the patients would be talking about seeing the little people and people having uh, putting bad medicine on them and doing those kinds of things and that was all part of the culture but the doctors who were not part of the culture didn't understand that and thought oh a candidate for the Alzheimer's study and so people were literally being made very sick and almost dying because they were getting these, these experimental drugs when they didn't really need them. They were <laughs> so they decided to start, because I was in home health, they said, well, you go out and do an assessment of the patient before we put them in the study because we don't want to make them ill or kill them. I thought, well, that's a really good idea, so <laughs> let's go do that. So, <laughs> so I would go out and, and visit with them and talk to them about uh, what they were experiencing and what they and they would explain to me about different things and and I knew enough to be able to tell whether it was cultural 
they were talking about something from their culture or if they were actually having a hallucination uh, and, uh, or were in a delusional sense. And by far, mostly, they were not. They were not. Um, and sometimes you could um, figure out what was going on with them nutritionally that was also inter interfering with uh, their ability to have um, clear cognitive functions. So we have that uh, legacy of intentions that we still live with and that a, a lot of people uh, don't really see the, um, the impact of that. And then the other thing that's kind of overlaid with that is uh, there are more laws written regulating Native American people than any other group in this whole country. There's thousands and thousands of laws that uh, restrict this or restrict that or limit this or limit that and, and it creates um, a lot of, uh, of issues uh, in terms of how you feel valued, how you feel uh, accepted, uh, and how uh, you feel that uh, you're free to express your culture. So returning to center, what does that mean? Well, to me that means getting back to the basic connecting point that we all have with our source, with our creator, with whatever name you ascribe that to. So I like this, uh, this example of a medicine wheel to show you. It's, um, it, is a, it is one for healing that I found. There's the website for it if you <laughs> want to look it up. It's, again, it just shows the versatility and how people have used the medicine wheel. And so it's looking for, um, it kind of gives you the different ways that you can get back to the power that you have and to, to your center. So I think it's talking about those cultural things that, um, help people heal, that help people um, reclaim their joy in spite of their uh, limitations that, that might be, they might have within themselves or that have been imposed on them. Um, with the kinds of things that are ongoing, how do you nurture yourself, how do you survive in those, in those situations where um, it's just difficult to maneuver uh, because of, of limitations and restrictions. Um, so I wanted to show you uh, that one to, to uh, talk about taking responsibility and uh, I think we have a responsibility for ourselves, but we also have a responsibility uh, society, society wise and cultural wise in all cultures the, particularly the American culture to look at how are we taking care of ourselves of our children of our elders and how is that reflected in in our life uh, in our everyday life and also in our uh, societal life as a whole and what's important to us? How do we how do we assign value to what's really important? So I think the spiritual connection is is really um, primary. And as we wind down, I want to uh, share with you a little bit of um, how this would work with my own culture. So one of the things that um, that the that the Cherokees use for healing is our crystals. Uh, we very much use crystals are um, have long been used to communicate they are programmable uh, they they put out energy as well as taking it in and th so they can be programmed for uh, for lots of things and so today I have some as we go to questions I have some crystals that have been programmed for um, uh, for uh, healing for protection for um, blessing they're actually blessed crystals. So I'm gonna pass that around and you feel free to take one if you want. If you don't, that's fine with me, I'll keep it. But uh, I want you to, to have that. I, it's my way of, of giving back to you for spending your time listening to me and for uh, sharing this space that we have. It's, it's a pleasure and, and an honor to, to do that for you. So I'll turn that to questions now and I'll send this around. Any questions? Let's see. We'll just see. Yes. It's heavy. Whoops. Yes. Now my question is like, for example, let's try. Um, how do you actually use the wheel, for example, um, in a case study? Like for in a case study? Oh, that would be easy. Because if you look at the, uh, um, the east is, is, like I said, if you, we probably need one that's, show, that's a little less busy than this. I'll go back to one of the others. It'll be, make it easier to explain. So if you look at this one, 
you can look at it from the aspect of emotional. So what you could actually do in a case study, look what is the emotional component of the person, what's happening with them emotionally. Then you go to mental, spiritual, physical. And then the, pe the place in the, mi in the middle symbolizes, well, what does all that mean to them? What's the personal connection to them? What does it mean that they have, um, maybe you have a di uh, someone who is diabetic, who has diabetes, who has had an amputation. What does that mean to them? So you would, you might, that might look phys totally physical to you, but it's, it affects all the other realms. And so when you're talking about the case study, you have to always go back to what is that person, what is their personal meaning to it? So that's where you go to that connecting point. And then you have to look at, well, how does that, how does that relate to their uh, spiritual connection? Are they, um, do they, do they have this, have a good attitude about this? Do they have a good sense of that, whatever they lost, their foot or their leg is not all of them, that it is, it is um, a piece that's maybe already gone on for them and that uh, they will catch up with it later or whatever. So it just depends on, on that person's background as how they might view something like that. But you can, if you look at the wheel, you can take in, you, you don't miss any pieces of that. If you look at it from the, those aspects that are very obvious and then the aspects of within, how does it affect the person within and then how does it affect their connection to uh, the more, the higher, the higher power, the, their, their God, their creator, uh, whatever name they choose to call it. So that's my, yes. Um, in the little email um, that my son sent me about your talk today, mm -hmm. Uh, at the end it said, we will look at how the mind, body, spirit movement in healthcare is bringing balance back to traditions and science and mental health for Native Americans. I was curious, is that because I work in, um, in, in the mental health field mm -hmm. and there's the recovery movement in the last mm -hmm. 15 to 20 years. Is it because realization that recovery is possible and it promotes health um, uh, and, 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 and uh, integration and a better way of living for people, did that sort of allow this idea to be utilized more? How is it that that mind-body movement and mental health has affected, opened it up to this, or has it? I think so. I think it makes it more, um, uh, more of a tool that people could, could you look at using, just like she asked about how would you do a case study. It, it kind of helps you see that if you cover all those different realms, you're being more holistic. You're being more, um, you're addressing more of the whole person and all the ways that they interact rather than compartmentalizing them. Well, if you have this problem, you go to, to orthopedics. If you have this problem, you go to the dermatologist. You know, so that, that it becomes more, uh, as she said, it's all blending uh, together so that you have to address it in some way. You may not, might, might not be the expert in that piece of it, but you certainly have to talk about the, how it impacts their life, how it impacts the other things that you may be dealing with directly. So I think it kind of brings things back to that, to, into that circle. I think you, people, if people can be seen as part of a circle of, of elements, then you can address all those elements. And I think that the mind, body, spirit, particularly the focus on, medica on meditation and yoga and all the different things, those are not new things. You know, those are old things that are just kind of being resurrected. The other thing that's being, that, need, that I think eventually, hopefully will get resurrected is the, um, the use of the natural elements for healing. You know, good water, air, uh, sunlight. You know, we have such an aversion to sunshine. That's why there's massive vitamin D <laughs> deficiency in this in, in in this country because everybody puts on sunscreen. It's in your makeup, it's in your lotions, it's in everything, and so you don't actually get the benefits of the sun to do that conversion process. I know when you put the simpler wheel on, I realized it reminded me of a mental health recovery workbook that I've used in groups, mm -hmm. and it has a wheel, it has different items named, so you can try to assess, is this part of myself balanced or unbalanced? Right. You know, work with it. Yeah, it can be as simple or as complex as you want to make it, and that's the nice thing about it is, is it really holds that, because it is a life wheel, it, so it's very encompassing with that. And I think the the medicine wheel, the dream catcher, those kinds of things that um, people have kind of adopted and, and use um, are, uh, are, are, you know, could be seen as cultural appropriation, but in terms of, of uh, usefulness to a lot of people, I think there is that element of it that if it's used respectfully, then it, it can be useful. I think I just 
want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> This matters, mm -hmm. and it is desperately needed. And the, the piece about the spiritual component, I just want to underline that. Yes. That's everything. Yes. That's everything. I think that without that connection, then this the boundaries of this kind of just get all smushy, and you can't really define what your life's about what your life purpose is and all those. And I think if you um, look at it in terms of, of the, what's missing for our, in terms of our high, the, some of the high suicide rates we have on some of the reservations, I think that spiritual component is definitely the missing piece. I think even though they, their life might be poorer than other people, or, or it might be, uh, or it might be richer if they're on one of the, the wealthy ones. It doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't make them not susceptible to those impulses to go home. It's about being able to stay in this space as long as you need to, to, to work on this path versus, you know, returning to source. Yeah, I thought what you said about it's two-dimensional, mm -hmm. becomes three-dimensional when you add spirit, mm -hmm. personal and greater spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is definitely, this is definitely a, a misrepresentation in terms of how it's actually lived, the lived experience of it, because there is definitely that spiritual connection. Without it, it really is just a flat, flat earth type thing. That suicide rate tied to a lack of spirituality is hardly limited to North America. Exactly. The nations in Europe with the highest suicide rates have the lowest levels of spirituality, Sweden, Lithuania. Mm -hmm. mm hmm that's okay there you go so it is there is that connection and then uh, you can have all these filled to the brim with stuff and if you don't have that connection it doesn't matter it doesn't matter so yes uh, good timing <laughs> I, I wanted to ask if you could say more about uh, what, what it means that crystals are programmable Oh, well, that's been discovered. That's an old science discovery. I, I can say that clearly because that's what we originally used in radios. <laughs> so they were programmed. They were programmed to send and programmed to receive. That's how we, we were able to do initial communication across the airwaves was through crystals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you guys finally caught up with us. <laughs> <laughs> We were happy because then you didn't make us quit using our crystals. <gasps> but a, a lot of uh, uh, the, the Cherokee medicine people use crystals and um, use them for whatever. I mean, they're a nice gift. And so you all get your blessing, your Cherokee blessed crystals. Any other questions? Yes. I just want to say thank you also, and I'm also very grateful to Joan and the, and the groups that have supported this because not only is this conversation long overdue, it's to be able to be here to witness this opportunity of shifting and recovery and hopefully reconciliation at some point mm -hmm. because of the wisdom that is available not only to you know, give that back to the Native people, but it's also information that's helpful to all of us. Of course. And to the people that have come here, obviously, I'm assuming are interested in working with Native peoples to, um, to really um, be educated about Native history and what has taken place to really look at the intergenerational trauma and how significant that is for the health of Native people today. Mm -hmm. That's to yeah. All of you who are interested, I highly recommend you look at the history. Yeah, exactly. The real history. The real history. <laughs> the real history. Not the people came over to work <laughs> history. <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> Not the history like that. <laughs> so, yeah, and because it's a hard truth. It's a hard truth, but if we don't look at it, if we don't face it, if we don't talk about it, it's always going to be the shadow that keeps us from seeing each other clearly. It's always going to be there. And so I think we just have to open up the dialogue, talk about it, and, and agree to disagree, if nothing else. I mean, we don't have to agree on everything to talk about it. We don't have to 
set any kind of solution. I don't know that there is a set solution. We just kind of have to evolve that solution. Thanks. Did you get one? Okay. Uh, we have to evolve that out. And, you know, my, my current, because I've been teaching about resilience in elderly and mental health, and because I've, I've worked in communities doing community-based research for a long time, my, my interest in research is really shifting to um, cultural buffers. What kinds of buffers does, do? because if you think about the, the hundreds of years of, of legacy of, of destruction, of annihilation of the culture, of all those things that happened over the years, and if you really start looking at the list, you're, you're just going to make you cringe. How did people survive that? How, in the, how did that happen? Well, there's something there, you know, and I'm, so the, the buffers are there, the, uh, the, the cues are there, so I'm looking at this cutting edge science about how people, how athletes can get better. I'm thinking, how does that relate to a culture getting better? And so, you know, I'm kind of looking at lots of different things that, so my sh interest has shifted from, and it's, this is a hard move though, because everything in research is real disease focused. It's like, let's focus on the sickness, let's focus on the problem. How can we make a solution instead of, okay, well, we know that the, if people have survived to this point, what makes them strong? What keeps them going? And how do we make that better and spread that out versus just attacking an illness that we can't seem to get ahead of? Because have we won the war on, can on cancer? No. Have we won the war on diabetes? No. You know, so the, way, the approach that we're taking, I think, is particularly for my own culture, doesn't work. It hasn't worked. So I prefer to look at the, the, the things that are working and how do you get those stronger, how do you build those up, how do you pass those around to share with people because I think at some level it's all about our humanity and not so much about, well, you know, this person's Cherokee and this person is Creek and this person is Cheyenne or, or, or this person is Irish and this person is whatever. You know, there's a point in there where we all come together, where we've all been mixed up as as elements of the earth and the stars, and then we all we form into these bodies, and so there's there's always a connecting point that we can find, so that we can find a common ground to work towards helping everybody be better and happier. So that's my spiel. <laughs> that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you.